chapter 21. Tiny, searing stabs, wherever the droplets of mist touch my skin. Run! I scream at the others. Run! Finnick snaps awake instantly, rising to counter an enemy. But when he sees the wall of fog, he tosses a still-sleeping Mags onto his back and takes off. Pete is on his feet, but not as alert. I grab his arm and begin to propel him through the jungle after Finnick. What is it? What is it? He says in bewilderment. Some kind of fog! Poisonous gas! Hurry, Peta! I urge. I can tell that however much he denied it during the day, the after effects of hitting the force field have been significant. He's slow, much slower than usual, and the tangle of vines and undergrowth which unbalance me occasionally trip him at every step. I look back at the wall of fog, extending in a straight line as far as I can see in either direction. A terrible impulse to flee, to abandon Pita and save myself shoots through me. It would be so simple to run full out, perhaps to even climb a tree above the fog line, which seems to top out at above 40 feet. I remember how I just did this when the mutations appeared at the last games. Took off and only thought of Pita at when I'd reached the cornucopia. But this time, I trap my terror, push it down, and stay by his side. This time, my survival isn't the goal. Pita's is. I think of the eyes glued to the television screens in the districts, seeing if I will run as the capital wishes or hold my ground. I lock my fingers tightly into his and say, Watch my feet. Just step where I step. It helps. We seem to move a little faster, but never enough to afford a rest, and the mist continues to lap at our heels. Droplets spring free of the body of vapor. They burn, but not like fire. Less a sense of heat and more an intense pain as the chemicals find our flesh, cling to it, and burrow down through the layers of skin. Our jumpsuits are no help at all. We may as well be dressed in tissue paper for all the protection they give. Finnick, who bounded off initially, stops when he realizes we're having problems. But this is not the thing you can fight, only evade. He shouts encouragement, trying to move us along, but the sound of his voice acts as a guide, though little more. Peta's artificial leg catches in a knot of creepers, and he sprawls forward before I can catch him. As I help him up, I become aware of something scarier than the blisters, more debilitating than the burns. The left side of his face has sagged, as if every muscle in it has dried. The lid droops, almost concealing his eye. His mouth twists at an odd angle toward the ground. Peta, I begin, and that's when I feel the spasms run up my arm. Whatever chemical laces the fog does more than burn, it targets our nerves. A whole new kind of fear shoots through me as I yank Peta forward, which only causes him to stumble again. By the time I get him to his feet, both of my arms are twitching uncontrollably. The fog has moved in on us, the body of it less than a yard away. Something is wrong with Pia's legs. He's trying to walk, but they move in spastic, puppet-like fashions. I feel him lurch forward and I realize Finnick has come back for us and is hauling Pita along. I wedge my shoulder, which still seems under my control, and under Pita's arm and do my best to keep up with Finnick's rapid pace. We put about ten yards between us and the fog and Finnick stops. It's no good. I'll have to carry him. Can you take Mags? Yes, I say stoutly, although my heart stinks. It's true that Mags can't weigh more than about 70 pounds, but I'm not very big myself. Still, I'm sure I've carried heavier loads, if only my arms would stop jumping around. I squat down as she positions herself over my shoulder the way she rides on Finnick. I slowly straighten my legs, and with my knees locked, I can manage her. Finnick has Pita slung across his back now, and we move forward, Finnick leading, me following in the trail he breaks through the vines. On the fog comes, silent and steady and flat, except for the grasping tendrils. Although my instinct is to run directly away from it, I realize Finnick is moving in a diagonal down the hill. He's trying to keep a distance from the gas while steering us toward the water that surrounds the cornucopia. Yes, water, I think, as the acid droplets bore deeper into me. Now I'm so thankful I didn't kill Finnick, because how could I have gotten Peta out of here alive? So thankful to have someone else by my side, even if it's only temporary. It's not Mags's fault when I begin falling. She's doing everything she can to be an easy passenger, but the fact is, there's only so much weight I can handle, especially now that my right leg seems to be going stiff. The first two times I crashed to the ground, I managed to make it back to my feet, but the third time, I cannot get my leg to cooperate. As I struggle to get up, it gives out and Mags rolls off onto the ground before me. I flail around, trying to use the vines and trunks to right myself. Finnix back to my side, Peter hanging over him. It's no use, I say. Can you take them both? Go ahead, I'll catch up. 
a somewhat doubtful proposal, but I say it with as much surety as I can muster. I can see Finnick's eyes, green in the moonlight. I can see them clear as day, almost like a cat's, with a strange reflective quality, because they're shiny with tears. No. I can't carry them both. My arms aren't working. It's true. His arms jerk uncontrollably at his sides. His hands are empty. Of his three tridents, only one remains, and it's in Peta's hands. I'm sorry, Mags. I can't do it. What happens next is so fast, so senseless, I can't even move to stop it. Mags hauls herself up, plants a kiss on Finnick's lips, and then hobbles straight into the fog. Immediately, her body is seized by wild contortions, and then she falls to the ground in a horrible dance. I want to scream, but my throat is on fire. I take one futile step in her direction, then I hear the cannon blast, and I know her heart has stopped, that she is dead. Finnick! I call out hoarsely, but I know he has already turned from the scene, already continued to retreat from the fog. Dragging my useless leg behind me, I stagger after him, having no idea what else to do. Time and space lose meaning as the fog seems to invade my brain, muddling my thoughts, making everything unreal. Some deep-rooted animal desire for survival keeps me stumbling after Finnick and Peta continuing to move, although I'm probably dead already. Parts of me are dead or clearly dying, and Mags is dead. This is something I know, or maybe I just think I know, because it makes no sense at all. Moonlight glinting off of Finnick's bronze hair, beads of searing pain peppering me, a leg turned to wood. I follow Finnick until he collapses on the ground, Peta still on top of him. I seem to have no ability to stop my own forward motion and simply propel myself onward until I trip over their prone bodies, just one more on the heap. This is where and how and when we all die, I think. But the thought is abstract and far less alarming than the current agonies of my body. I hear Finnick groan and manage to drag himself off the others. Now I can see the wall of fog, which has taken on a pearly white quality. Maybe it's my eyes playing tricks or the moonlight, but the fog seems to be transforming. Yes, it's becoming thicker, as if it's been pressed up against a glass window or being forced to condense. I squint harder and realize the fingers no longer protrude from it. In fact, it has stopped moving forward entirely. Like the other horrors I have witnessed in the arena, it has reached the end of its territory. Either that or the game makers have decided not to kill us just yet. It's stopped, I try to say but only an awful croaking sound comes from my swollen mouth. It's up, oh, I say again, and this time it must be clear because both Peta and Finnick turn their heads to the fog. It begins to rise upward now, as if being slowly vacuumed into the sky. We watch until it has been sucked away and not the slightest wisp remains. Peta rolls off Finnick, who turns over onto his back. We lie there gasping, twitching, our minds and bodies invaded by the poison. After a few minutes pass, Peta vaguely gestures upward. Monkeys. I look up and spot a pair of what I guess are monkeys. I've never seen a live monkey. There's nothing like that in our woods at home. But I must have seen a picture or one in the games because when I see the creatures, the same word comes to my mind. I think these have orange fur, though it's hard to tell, and are about half the size of a full-grown human. I take the monkeys for a good sign. Surely they would not hang around if the air was deadly. For a while, we quietly observe one another, humans and monkeys. Then Peter struggles to his knees and crawls down the slope. We all crawl, since walking now seems as remarkable a feat as flying. We crawl until the vines turn into a narrow strip of sandy beach and the warm water that surrounds the cornucopia laps our faces. I jerk back as if I've touched an open flame. Rubbing salt in a wound, for the first time, I truly appreciate the expression, because the salt in the water makes the pain of my wound so blinding I nearly black out. But there's another sensation, of drawing out. I experiment by gingerly placing my hand in the water. Torturous, yes, but then less so. And through the blue layer of the water, I see a milky substance leaching out of the wounds of my skin. As the whiteness diminishes, so does the pain. I unbuckle my belt and strip off my jumpsuit, which is little more than a perforated rag. My shoes and undergarments are inexplicably unaffected. Little by little, one small portion of a limit at a time, I soak the poison out of my wounds. Peta seems to be doing the same, but Finnick backed away from the water at first touch and lies face down on the sand, either unwilling or unable to purge himself. 
Finally, when I've survived the worst, opening my eyes underwater, sniffing water into my sinuses and snorting it out, and even gargling repeatedly to wash out my throat, I'm functional enough to help Finnick. Some feeling has returned to my leg, but my arms are still riddled with spasms. I can't drag Finnick into the water, and possibly the pain would kill him anyway. So I scoop up shaky handfuls and empty them onto his fists. Since he's not underwater, the poison comes out of his wounds just as it went in, and wisps of fog I take great care to steer clear of. Peter recovers enough to help me. He cuts away Finnick's jumpsuit. Somewhere he finds two shells that work much better than our hands do. We concentrate on soaking Finnick's arms first since they've been so badly damaged, and even though a lot of white stuff pours out of them, he doesn't notice. He just lies there, eyes shut, giving an occasional moan. I look around, with growing awareness of how dangerous a position we're in. It's night, yes, but the moon gives off too much light for concealment. We're lucky no one's attacked us yet. We could see them coming from the cornucopia, but if all four careers attacked, they'd overpower us. If they didn't spot us at first, Phoenix moans would give us away soon. We've got to get more of him into the water, I whisper. But we can't put him in face first, not while he's in this condition. Peter nods to Finnick's feet. We take each one, pull him 180 degrees around, and start to drag him into the salt water. Just a few inches at a time. His ankles, wait a few minutes. Up to his mid-calf, wait. His knees. Clouds of white swirl out from his flesh and he groans. We continue to detoxify him bit by bit. What I find is that the longer I sit in the water, the better I feel. Not just my skin, but my brain and muscle control continue to improve. I can see Peter's face beginning to return to normal, his eyelid opening, the grimace leaving his mouth. Phoenix slowly begins to revive. His eyes open, focus on us, and register awareness that he's being helped. I rest his head on my lap, and we let him soak about ten minutes with everything immersed from the neck down. Peter and I exchange a smile as Finnick lifts his arms above the seawater. There's just your head left, Finnick. That's the worst part, but you'll feel much better after if you can bear it. We help him to sit up and let him grip our hands as he purges his eyes and nose and mouth. His throat is too raw to speak. I'm gonna try to tap a tree. My fingers fumble at my belt and find the spile still hanging from its vine. Let me make a hole first. You stay with him. You're the healer. That's a joke, I think, but I don't say it out loud since Finnick has enough to deal with. He got the worst of the fog, although I'm not sure why. Maybe because he's the biggest, or maybe because he had to exert himself the most. And then, of course, there's Mags. I still don't understand what happened there. Why he essentially abandoned her to carry Peta? Why she not only didn't question it, but ran straight to her death without a moment's hesitation? Was it because she was so old that her days were numbered anyway? Did they think that Finnick would stand a better chance of winning if he had Peta and me as allies? That haggard look on Finnick's face tells me that now is not the moment to ask. Instead, I try to pull myself back together. I rescue my Mockingjay pin from my ruined jumpsuit and pin it to the strap of my undershirt. The flotation belt must be acid-resistant, since it looks good as new. I can swim, so the flotation belt's not really necessary. But Brutus blocked my arrow with his, so I buckle it back on, thinking it might offer some protection. I undo my hair and comb it back with my fingers, thinning it out considerably since the fog droplets damage it, and then braid back what's left of it. Peter has found a good tree about ten yards from the narrow strip of beach. We can hardly see him, but the sound of the knife against the wood trunk is crystal clear. I wonder what happened to the awl. Mags must have either dropped it or taken it into the fog with her. Anyway, it's gone. I've moved out a bit further into the shallows, floating alternatively on my belly and back. The seawater healed Peta and me. It seems to be transforming Finnick altogether. He begins to move slowly, just testing his limbs and gradually begins to swim. But it's not like me swimming, the rhythmic strokes, the even pace. It's like watching some strange sea animal come back to life. He dives and surfaces, spraying water out of his mouth, rolls over and over in some bizarre corkscrew motion that makes me dizzy even to watch. And then, when he's been underwater so long I feel certain he's drowned, said pops up right next to me and I start. Don't do that. What? Come up or stay under? Either. Neither. Whatever. Just soak in the water and behave. Or if you feel this good, let's go help Peta. In just the short time it takes to cross the edge of the jungle, I become aware of the change. Put it down to years of hunting, or maybe my reconstructed ear does work a little better than anyone intended. But I sense the mass of warm bodies poised above us. They don't need to chatter or scream. The mere breathing of so many is enough. 
I touch Finnick's arm and he follows my gaze upward. I don't know how they arrived so silently. Perhaps they didn't. We've all been so absorbed in restoring our bodies. During that time, they've assembled. Not five or ten, but scores of monkeys weigh down the limbs of jungle trees. The pair we've spotted when we first escaped the fog felt like a welcoming committee. This crew feels ominous. I arm my bow with two arrows and Finnick adjusts the trident in his hand. Peta, I say as calmly as possible. I need your help with something. Okay, just a minute. I think I've just about got it. He says, still occupied with the tree. Yes, there. Have you got the spile? I do, but we found something you'd better take a look at. I continue in a measured voice. Only move toward us quietly so you don't startle it. For some reason, I don't want him to notice the monkeys or even glance their way. They're creatures that interpret mere eye contact as aggression. Peter turns to us, panting from his work on the tree. The tone of my request is so odd that it's alerted him to some irregularity. Okay. He says casually. He begins to move through the jungle, although I know he's trying hard to be quiet. This has never been his strong suit, even when he had two sound legs. But it's all right. He's moving. The monkeys are holding their positions. He's just five yards from the beach when he senses them. His eyes only dart up for a second but it's as if he triggered a bomb. The monkeys explode into a shrieking mass of orange fur and converge on him. I've never seen any animal move so fast. They slide down the vines as if the things were greased. Leap impossible distances from tree to tree, fangs bared, hackles raised, claws shooting out like switchblades. I may be unfamiliar with monkeys, but animals in nature don't act like this. Mutts! I spit out as Finnick and I crash into the greenery. I know every arrow must count, and they do. In the eerie light, I bring down monkey after monkey, targeting eyes, hearts, and throats, so that each hit means a death. But still, it wouldn't be enough without Finnick spearing the beasts like fish and flinging them aside, Peter slashing them away with his knife. I feel claws on my leg, down my back, before someone takes out the attacker. The air grows heavy with trampled plants, the scent of blood, and the musty stink of the monkeys. Peter and Finnick and I position ourselves in a triangle a few yards apart, our backs to one another. My heart sinks as my finger draws back my last arrow. Then I remember Peta has a sheath too. And he's not shooting, he's hacking away with the knife. My own knife is out now, but the monkeys are quicker. Can spring in and out so fast you can barely react. Peta, your arrows! Peta turns to see my predicament and is sliding off his sheath when it happens. A monkey lunges out from a tree for his chest. I have no arrow, no way to shoot. I can hear the thud of Finnick's trident finding another mark and know his weapon is occupied. Peta's knife arm is disabled as he tries to remove the sheath. I throw my knife at the oncoming mup, but the creature somersaults, evading the blade and stays on its trajectory. Weaponless, defenseless, I do the only thing I can think of. I run for Peta to knock him to the ground to protect his body with mine, even though I know I won't make it in time. She does, though. Materializing, it seems, from thin air. One moment nowhere, the next reeling in front of Peta. Already bloody, mouth open, and a high-pitched scream. Pupils enlarge, so her eyes seem like black holes. The insane morphling from District 6 throws up her skeletal arms as if to embrace the monkey, and it sinks its fangs into her chest.